morning, church. Good to see you here this morning. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. To those of you joining us online, it's good to see you here this morning. So glad that you can join us that way as well. And uh, at Salem Alliance, we value life with Jesus together and on mission. And we believe that there are next steps that we can take in each one of those areas. That's why you keep hearing us talk about Next Steps Weekend. And we'd love to just point this out one more time. If you go on to our church webpage, maybe not now, maybe now, whatever you feel like, scroll down, there's Next Steps Weekend. You can click that and you can just find out different ways to get engaged on those next steps. We have things happening Friday and Saturday, even next Sunday, an opportunity to meet some of the pastors here and would love to have you join us for one of those times next weekend. You can, on this next slide, uh, use this QR code to get you to that link, or you can just go on to the webpage and do that. We would love to have you join us for that as well. And if you'll notice, we have four roses on the platform. Roses are just a way that we indicate when someone has put their faith in Jesus, and we're going to celebrate early. All right. It's for Owen and Ian and Morgan and Jojo who gave their lives to Jesus last weekend. And so I just want to pray for them and pray for the service as we keep going. Jesus, we thank you for those four. Those four represented by these roses. And we just pray just blessing over them. I just pray that as that seed has been planted, that those roots would grow deep, that you would draw community around them, that they would grow in you, that they would produce fruit. We just thank you for your gospel that changes lives. And Jesus says, we spend time in your word this morning. We pray that it would also change our lives. Holy Spirit, move in this place uniquely, individually, as you always do. Make your word come alive to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've ever been to Disney, you know that it is a place where joy and wonder are serious business. They've given themselves the tagline, the happiest place on earth. And it is. It's an incredibly joyful place, but with a surprising amount of things that actually diminish that joy. <laughs> for instance, the price. And not just the price to get into the park, the price for everything in the park. When my kids want churros, I can't help but make a mental list of all the things that I could have paid for with the money I'm spending on churros, like groceries for the week or a car, you know, those kind of things, right? And then I get stuck in this trap of doing the ratio of time spent in line versus actually on a ride. Anybody else do that in this place? Just me and a couple of other Scrooges. I mean, people in this place, right? Because if my joy is being diminished, I want people to know that we spent two hours and 20 minutes in line for 39 seconds on a ride. That feels worth it, doesn't it? And then you're bumping into people all day, and then you're waiting in a long line just to get your picture with a large rodent. <laughs> and then your kids want more churros, and isn't vacation supposed to be restful? And if I stay focused on those things, then my joy meter is at absolute zero. But here's the thing, none of those frustrations actually add up to the joy that can be experienced while you're there. In particular, I find joy when I'm there with my children because I love the childlike wonder of entering Cars Land and having them be like, it's just like we're in the movie, it's so amazing, or their laughter as we ride Space Mountain, or just that exhausted, joyful, reminiscing about all of the experiences that they've had. And at the end of the day, my father's heart is full. And something that could be so absolutely draining is actually filling. And as my kids are filled with joy, I am filled with joy as well. And the sacrifice then becomes worth it because the joy far outweighs the frustration. And so we lean in and we go back and we participate in this serious business of joy. And we all understand those moments, right? Those moments that we have these kind of two conflicting things. We've got the frustrations that happen and we have the joy that's available. And what do we do in those moments? And so this morning, I want to talk about the serious business of joy that Jesus initiates. 
And I want us to understand this idea that joy is the serious business of Jesus. Joy is the serious business of Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but Jesus, he is the most joyful person ever. Jesus leads the way in joy. And even when we find freedom in him, he's still more joyful about that than we are. And a lot of times when we talk about joy, we want to talk about, okay, how do I get joy? How do I live joyfully? How do I hang on to the joy that I have in my own life? But this morning, we want to look at the joy of Jesus. And instead of asking the question, how can I get joy? We want to ask the question, how can I give joy? How can I make Jesus more joyful if that's even possible? And so I want to talk about those two things. I want to talk about this idea first, though, that Jesus leads the way in joy. That he's the most joyful person ever. So if you would, just for a second, I want you to get a picture in your head of what Jesus looks like. Get a picture in your head. What does Jesus look like? And maybe it's similar to this picture here. Uh, This picture that hung in church fellowship halls for decades, and we know it's a wildly accurate picture because it was painted in 1940, so certainly it reflects everything that Jesus looks like as he looks seriously into the middle distance. This second picture is Jesus at the Last Supper. It's da Vinci's painting, and it's probably the most famous image of Jesus in the world. This third picture here is is from a mosaic from the 12th century. That's Jesus with a very serious-looking stash. And um, you probably notice in these pictures, in these paintings, that we have a first very Western-looking Jesus, and in large part, it's the fault of the Renaissance movement. Because the Renaissance movement gave us some of the most well-known, well-loved artists and works of art. And they understood that Jesus was Middle Eastern, but they wanted to paint him as approachable and as accessible. And so they painted Jesus to look like them. They painted Jesus as if he was one of them. And oftentimes these great artists would paint themselves into the painting as well. And so Jesus has become a little bit more European than Middle Eastern. And I'm not quite sure then how Jesus came to wear either a red or blue beauty pageant sash. I'm not sure where that came from. But that's kind of what we notice when we kind of image Jesus, that he feels a little bit more Western. But I want you to go that next layer. As you have this mental image of Jesus, I don't want you to think about appearance. I want you to think about disposition. I want you to think about the disposition of Jesus, because usually as we see in these paintings and and I think as we see in our mental images, Jesus is either serious or sorrowful, but not really joyful. Now, this kind of image of Jesus being sorrowful is an accurate depiction. Isaiah 53 says that he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. Jesus understood sorrow. He understood that it can coexist with joy, though. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. And so when we speak of joy, we need to understand that joy is not the absence of sorrow. Joy is actually experiencing and delighting in the grace of God in the midst of sorrow. Joy is us leaning towards those steadfast, eternal promises of God. And in our broken world, joy is often an act of resistance. It's often an act of protest. That's what joy is. And Jesus experienced sorrow, but we have to understand, we have to have this picture of him as the most joyful person ever. And if you Google joyful Jesus, it's honestly just a little bit cringy because there's not like great works of art that show joyful Jesus. Like I pulled this picture up because I thought, yeah, it's kind of, but isn't there something even about that picture where you're like, I don't know. And so how do we know this to be true? How do we know that it's joyful, Jesus? If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, and you could turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Now, the author of Hebrews, what he's doing is making the case for the supremacy of Christ in all things. 
And so we kind of get to the beginning of Hebrews and we see this resume of Jesus. And as we look through his credentials to see what he's supreme in, we come to a couple verses about joy. It's verses 8 and 9. This is God speaking and it's actually from Psalm 45. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. Pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else. Ancient kings and priests were consecrated to their offices by the oil being poured over their head. And it was to symbolize the abundance of God and the blessing of God. And so Jesus... He's anointed as prophet, priest, and king. And we find that he's superior in all things. He's superior in love and in leadership and in courage and compassion and in justice. And as we see here, in joy. This is the oil of a fiercely profound joy. Jesus is perfect in joy and he wants to perfect that in us. Now, we can't scroll through the Instagram of Jesus, so we can't see, you know, when these moments were. We don't have any actual photos of the time of Jesus. I hope in heaven one day there's an actual movie that we can sit and watch it. I don't know, just a personal wish of mine, but we can't really do that. We don't have those pictures, but we do get snapshots in Scripture. Snapshots where we can look at the joy of Jesus. I mean, think about his baptism where his father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is the smile of the father that secures identity. Jesus was never plagued by his conscience. Jesus never lost sleep replaying the many mistakes of his life. That's joy. But also think about those moments that he had with his family. Think about when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And Jesus at one point stands back and he sees Mary and Martha and Lazarus in a quiet embrace as tears of joy are streaming down their face. Think about the 5,000 plus, just that quiet, satisfied munching sound as they're eating a meal that Jesus miraculously brought out of nowhere. Think about Peter stepping out of the boat. And that first step, when the water held his weight and he looks up with Jesus with this look in his eyes like, it's working. (laughs) Or the leper whose skin had been white and diseased and now it's healed and he's sprinting off to tell his loved ones or the man born blind and the first face that he sees is the face of Jesus. These are joyful moments when Jesus is bringing joy to his family. But too often, I don't see him that way. The mental picture that I have of the disposition of Jesus is usually one that's sad, rolling his eyes, or frustrated. It looks a lot like this, if I'm honest. (laughs) This is the picture of Jesus that I have far too often. Palm face Jesus. Right? Oh, no, not again. But Hebrews tells us that he's the most joyful being in the universe. And he mirrors the infinite and indomitable joy of the Father, a joy that's impossible to subdue or defeat. And so why is this important? Why is it important that we just see Jesus as the most joyful person ever? And it's important because a gospel not characterized by this overwhelming joy is not the gospel. It's important because if we see Jesus as sad or angry or condemning us rather than joyful, then we're not seeing the true Jesus as revealed in Scripture. It's important that we see him this way because it changes his approachability, doesn't it? It changes how we come to him. And I love that our loving God has created joy to be such a foundational principle of his kingdom, 
that even in the midst of sorrow, joy still stands, and that Jesus modeled this for us, and he wants us to experience it, and he wants us to model it for other people. The oil of joy that was poured out on Jesus spills over onto us as well. And we need to recapture that picture of this joyful Jesus who leads the way in joy. And then we want to ask this question, how can we bring him joy? How can we bring joy to Jesus? There's a whole lot of answers. I want to focus on one. Thomas Goodwin, he's a theologian author from the 1600s. He has this quote. He says, Christ's own joy, comfort, happiness, and glory are increased and enlarged by blank. Now, we're going to fill in that blank in just a second. But I want you to think about it. How would you fill in the blank? How would you want to answer that? There are a lot of correct biblical answers that would complete this quote. We don't want to be one-dimensional in our biblical understanding. But what's our gut reaction? Is it that, that the joy of Christ is enlarged by disciples who make disciples? That, that could be it. Is it people who forsake all and wholeheartedly follow? That, that could be it. Is it read your Bible, pray every day? When I read this, I want to kind of fill it in with this personal action statement. I want to be like, yeah, Christ's own joy and comfort and happiness, it's enlarged by me being a better person. Like, do better. It's enlarged by me not being a doofus, let's be honest. As if God's looking at me and he's just like, oh, just don't make my job any harder than it already is, okay? Can I just ask that of you? But what Goodwin wrote, quite honestly, surprises me. He completes the quote this way. Christ's own joy, comfort, happiness, and glory are increased and enlarged by his showing grace and mercy in pardoning, relieving, and comforting his members here on earth. And of all the things that we could focus on to fill in that quote, I think this one is really key. See, what he's saying is that the joy of Jesus is increased by us bringing him our faults and failures so that we can receive forgiveness. He's saying that Jesus is joyful when we come to him in confession and repentance, and we don't always think that way. Now, where do we find this in Scripture? Hebrews chapter 12, if you want to flip over a few chapters. We're going to read verses 1 and 2, verses that are probably familiar to all of us. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Because of the joy awaiting him. Let's talk about that for just a second. Several times in Hebrews, actually. It talks about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father or being seated next to the Father. And this is a position of honor. It's a position of authority. But what it really means is that Jesus is the bridge between us and the Father. He's the mediator so that we can get back into right relationship with the Father. And so Jesus, as the high priest gave his life as the final atoning sacrifice to cover all of our sin. He bridged that gap. He created a way for us to get back into right relationship. And so Hebrews 12 is telling us that it was this joyous anticipation of seeing his people made invincibly clean that sent Jesus through his arrest and death and burial and resurrection. And when we come to Jesus with our sin and with our brokenness to, see, to receive forgiveness, we're going along with the deepest joy and wishes of Jesus. The joy awaiting Jesus, it's a redeemed us. 
A forgiven us, a restored us is the joy that was awaiting Jesus when we're forgiven, when we're sanctified, when we're made whole by this sacrifice. He's glorified and he is more joyful than we are. You see, when we come to Jesus with our sin and our mistakes, we're going along with his deepest wishes, not against them. When we come to Jesus again and again with our brokenness, that's what he wants us to do. But we don't always think this way, do we? We tend to, to live with this growing suspicion that the patience of God is wearing thin. We understand that God loves us. We sing about the fact that God loves us. But we also somehow think that he's deeply disappointed in us. And if not deeply disappointed, at least mildly resentful. Like Jesus comes close, but he holds his nose. And that's kind of how we view it. We think when we bring our baggage and our sin and, and the dumpster fires that is often us to Jesus that we somehow detract from him, that we diminish him, that we lessen him. But his heart is not drained by our coming to him. Actually, his heart is filled up all the more by our coming to him. Our mistakes do not diminish his mercy. We bring our garbage and he gives us grace and forgiveness and healing and we're both better off. The more I lay down, the more that I receive and the stronger I show his atoning sacrifice to be. But church family, when we hold back and when we refuse to come and when we lurk in the shadows, kind of fearful, kind of failing, we miss out not only on our own joy, but we miss out on the joy of Jesus. Because he lives for those moments. He loves those moments. He entered the grave to bring us out of the grave. I spent a lot of time this past week trying to think of, of how to actually illustrate this idea that, that we bring the mess and he brings the mercy and both are happy about it. And I can't really come up with this perfect example. The closest I can get is kind of as a parent, when your toddler's running around with a dirty diaper and you know that it's not good for anybody involved. Nobody's happy about that situation. The kid's not happy, you're not happy, and you know that you can't let this continue. And so you have to do something about it. Now, here's where it breaks down because in our humanness, we're not exactly thrilled to be the ones changing the diaper usually. But think about that moment. You know that it's for the best. You know that you can't just let that build up. You have to do something about that. And so it's good for the kid and it's good for you. And we also know that this is not a once and done thing. This is going to happen again. They're going to keep coming to us with dirty diapers and we're going to keep changing them. And if we can kind of in some weird way around that example, get this image of a joyful Jesus who's like, yeah, come. Come with your brokenness. Come with the mess. Come with the sin. I love that because I want to make you clean. Jesus is joyful when we confess because it's his body that's being healed. It's his own body. 1 Corinthians 12 says that we're all a part of one body as disciples of Christ. There's one body, it has many parts, and every part is vitally important. Ephesians 5 tells us that Christ is the head of that body, his church. And so when Jesus sees our brokenness, his natural instinct is not to shy away from it. When we bring our brokenness, his natural instinct isn't to turn away from us. It's to come towards us because it's bringing healing to his body. It's allowing us to be whole. Jesus came for our salvation. Jesus came for our restoration. He sacrificed himself for our sanctification. He came to unbind us from the things that have tied us up. And he doesn't just tolerate us in those moments. He loves us with an everlasting love and he finds joy in our freedom. And I kind of know this intellectually, but I still want to kind of qualify this truth. I think that if I come to Jesus with a new sin, understanding that there's no sin, but like a new to me sin, then I have grace on that first one. I get a pass, you know, free pass on the first one. But after that, I can't go back and confess the same sin again. 
not the same stuff over and over again. I should know better. And I feel like sometimes I'm tiresome to Jesus, which is why I have this image of Jesus doing this. But the forgiveness of Jesus is infinite. To quote the gospel of Buzz Lightyear, it's to infinity and beyond. To quote the actual gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, it speaks of the infinite nature of the forgiveness of Jesus, the infinite nature of his grace and mercy. And I understand that our unbelieving hearts have a hard time with this. And I understand that oftentimes we step out on this truth of grace and forgiveness and Jesus being joyful. And we step out on it timidly, apprehensively, as if it's thin ice, as if somehow throughout the history of the world we're going to be the first ones to do something so egregious that we're going to cause a crack in this Grace, and we're going to slip under the water out of the reach of the hand of Jesus. But church, the sacrifice of Jesus, the grace of Jesus is strong enough to hold our weight. It's strong enough to hold the weight of the world. The sacrifice of Jesus is sufficient and we need to take scripture seriously on this point that Jesus paid the price, that he wants us to be free. And when we confess in humility, there's healing. And it can't be too many times. It can't be too many times. This brings joy to Jesus and ultimately brings joy to us because joy is the serious business of Jesus. In John Chapter 15, Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy and your joy will overflow. Jesus wants us to spill over with his joy. So just three things real quick in closing. Three things that we can lean into to experience this joy more and more and to bring joy to him. First, pray and ask Holy Spirit to fill us with the joy of Jesus. The man of sorrows, who was the most joyful ever, modeled this for us, modeled what it looks like to live joyfully. And he wants us to experience it and model it to other people. And maybe something you can do, you know somebody that has unquenchable joy, don't you? And sometimes they're annoying, but most of the time they're great. You know that person. Would you go to them and ask them to pray this joy over you? Ask them to pray the joy of Jesus over you. The second thing I would say is this, keep coming to Jesus with our brokenness. This is that confession and repentance. There's a lot of times that I think we hide or we shy away or we feel like, ah, Jesus just doesn't want me to come to him with this. But understand that this brings him joy. So don't have that mental picture of an angry Jesus or a frustrated Jesus. Have a mental picture of a joyful Jesus who wants to restore relationship. And keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. And lastly, I would say this, stay focused. Because joy fades when we lose focus. That's why Hebrews 12 tells us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And we want to do that. Hebrews 12 has given us this word picture that we read about. It's it's a word picture of, of a race, that Jesus ran the race, that we are running the race, that Jesus understood the joy that was awaiting him, and we need to stay focused on the joy that's awaiting us. And in my imagination, this race looks a lot like a marathon. We understand a marathon, it's 26.2 miles of ouch, oftentimes, and uh, hard stuff and maybe some joy in that. We, we get what that looks like, but I think of it even as the Olympic marathon because it gives it a little more energy and kind of a global feel, and you understand that you're running along the streets for so much of the race, and there's people there who are cheering for you, and you know that you're running along, and Jesus, you have this voice that's just cheering you on, but the beauty of the Olympic marathon is that it ends in an Olympic stadium. And you go through this tunnel 
and you burst into the sunlight and the stadium is full. This is Hebrews 12 saying this great crowd of witnesses, those who have gone before and have found their joyful home forever and they're cheering you on and you're tired because you've run 26.1 of those miles but this kind of brings you energy and you can see people as Abraham and it's Moses and it's David and the disciples and I don't know how we recognize them, we just do and they're cheering as well. And you come around that last stretch and you look down and there's Jesus at the finish line. Abundantly, exceedingly joyful, cheering you on. The one who's pioneered and perfected, the one who's run before. The voice that you've heard all along the race is finally a face. Our faith has sight. And we need to stay focused on what we're running towards because eventually we're going to get to that finish line. And I know it's hard and I know it's difficult and I know it's long, but that's the joy that's waiting for us. And the end of that race is just the beginning of the serious business of joy that we'll get to live for eternity. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your word. And Jesus, I pray that you would just reshape how we view you. That you would just reshape how we see you, how we lean into you. I pray that you would continue to call us to be ones who come to you with all of our brokenness, that we would keep short accounts with you. And I pray that your joy would spill over onto us and fill us up and spill over onto those around us. Thank you for leading the way in this, Jesus. We love you in your name. Amen.